to over rely probably on Darwin, but I don't think you, I don't, there's not a scientific refutation of a religion or God, though I do think that religious belief is ultimately incompatible with. I, I take Dawkins aside over Stephen Gould. I think that they're not non-overlapping magisteria. Sure. I think they are hostile. Mm-hmm. They're incompatible. In other words, a person who is a theoretical physicist may be a believer in God, but he, he cannot possibly square it with his study of theoretical physics. It's a purely optional and private question. And it may flat out contradict his other findings. That wouldn't be at all uncommon. A, a, for example, the man I mentioned today, Joseph Priestley, the discoverer of oxygen, believed in the phlogiston theory. Mm-hmm. Isaac Newton was a spiritualist in Rose, <laughs> Alchemist Rose of Pollution, I think. Mm-hmm. Extraordinary thing. I mean, you'll find it, uh, I, and, until Einstein, Darwin set out to prove, to vindicate creationism by his studies of plant life. Um, until Einstein, I don't think you get the pure mind that says, we can. We actually have now an understanding of the cosmos, and it has no room for a personal god. Well, that's. But, I mean, but he said, it does have room for spinners as god if you insist. You can be a pantheist because pantheism cannot be refuted. But until that's the first time the real first there's a real scientist mm-hmm. in the world, Mr. Einstein. And the second, someone who says we now know enough to be able to see further than any religious person has ever seen. Well, people often and use that. Don't, you know. Um, Isaac Newton was a you know a religious believer, an alchemist, or whatever. In, in in a way, which is you know all once upon a time, all astronomers were also astrologers. You know these things just yes. happened to be part of the same magisterium. And then you know then they, there was a. I mean, I'm not sure they were all astrologers, but I mean were, it was very hard. Well, to it work. was the same science. There it were early there were very early refutations mm-hmm. of astrology long before we knew how many planets there were. For example, there was the, the other Pythagoras refuted astrology by actually by reference to, I think, to identical twins. I mean, there were lots of refutations there. But the compatibility of the scientific work with irrational belief is, is shouldn't surprise anybody. I mean, we are look. This is all done by mammals. Right? Mm-hmm. Everything that is done that, and written is done by people who are one half chromosome away from being a chimpanzee. Right? It's not going to be any better than that. <laughs> a lot of the criticism... That's of, why you can tell religion is man <laughs> A lot of the criticism of um, books by, say, um, Dawkins and Sam Harris and Daniel Dennett goes along the lines of that the authors don't understand what it is to be religious, to have religious belief. Yes. Um, what was your own experience of religion? Well, I was lucky in one sense in that um, my father was a, from a very strict Baptist family and was somewhat in flight from at least its rigidity. My grandfather was a very, very strict Calvinist. And my mother was a daughter of Judaism, but did not win- want to be identified as Jewish, wanted mm-hmm. to assimilate. Not to Christianity, but simply to English society. So that I, by pure luck, came from two branches that were, so to speak, uh, I don't know what the word for it would be, uh, they were anyway, non-dogmatic and not at all interested in converting me. Uh, I was sent to a Methodist school because they believed that, uh, though I was baptised in the Church of England because that was a social mobility question, they, they both had to move up a class and that was one way of getting into the middle class. Sent to a Methodist school because they believed that the education there was better, which it was. Um, never had to endure anything like confirmation or let alone a bar mitzvah. And wasn't at any of my schools inculcated more than everyone has to be. And enjoyed divinity classes and um, and scripture knowledge classes, um, and learned quite a lot from it. Um, and don't envy those who have no religious impulse at all. Mm. I mean, Pascal writes to the one who is so made that he cannot believe, which proves that it's always been known there are such people. Ian McEwan told me recently. I haven't checked this out yet, but it seems as we do more work on cognition. It's, it emerges that there, there has always been a minority of about 10 to 15 percent of human beings who just can't believe in God at all. They just don't have it. They don't have religion. Yeah. They all, for most of history, had to be very quiet about it and do the outward forms. I think I may be one of them because though I like, you know, if, if there's time when we're done, I'll probably go to Evenso because I haven't been since I was last in Oxford, just to see what it's like. And I enjoy doing that kind of thing. But I don't enjoy what the Church of England has done to, to the liturgy. Or to the prayer book. This is I like my Cranmer and my King James. <laughs> Pure thanks. Um, but I've never believed that any of it's true. As a literary critic, you 
say, and I've, I've heard, I mean, I remember being very struck by St. Paul's epistle to the, I think it's, it's the Philippians, isn't it, where he says, um, which I read um, at my father's funeral when I had to give the address at the, in the chapel of, overlooking Portsmouth Harbour, the D-Day chapel where Eisenhower gave the prayers before, before D-Day. And I, I did it because it has no religion in it. It says, as St. Paul says, uh, brethren, therefore, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are beautiful, or lovely, and of good report, think on these things. It's great. Wouldn't be without it. There's no religious impulse in that. And if you compare it to the verses on either side, it's like listening to a sonnet as opposed to the ravings of a clown. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there are moments of that kind, numinous moments, if you wish, um, associated also with music, architecture. Not in my mind with painting. I find devotional painting completely revolting. All of it. Rubens, the lot. Uh, oh, utterly, utterly no. Aesthetically repulsive. But not Gothic, not Gothic architecture and not Baroque music. I don't know why. I just That's by the way I am. Devotional painting nauseates me. So tell it us may some be something to do with Protestantism. I don't know. Yeah, I don't like your name. I don't like your name. It is I, I don't like iconography. Yeah, I don't yeah, like yeah, incense. Yeah. Sure. Perhaps it's a pro- slightly Protestant instinct, but um, that can't completely be true because the, the devotional music has a big influence on me, and as does the, even the more ornate kind of Gothic architecture. So tell us a little bit more about the book. What, what can we? We haven't read it. We're, we're, we're well, this before it's published. It's but. partly to say that the metaphysical claims of religion are not true, and therefore. The, you know, the cult, any, any cult of untruth or unreason is, um, even if it produces nice architecture, is probably to be very much distrusted. Then say the practical results of it are very uh, increasingly menacing, and that the uh, possible intersection of apocalyptic ideas or messianic ideas with apocalyptic weaponry, which is a, a one possible future, or one possible terminus is increasingly something to be very much worried about. And that religion is an insufficient safeguard against this because with a part of itself it must hope that this world comes to an end. It must seek that, wish it. It does in fact do so. And this is unhealthy, unwholesome. This is, this We'd is be like better off if we grew out of it. This is an accusation that it's often brought against um, well, um, President Tom Dindad and probably more so in the Western world, um, George Bush. Do you think there's any real truth in the claims of either or, in the claims brought against either or, either or both, that they really are willing the apocalypse? It was, it, it used to strike me as possibly very riskily true of Ronald Reagan, mm. in that we knew that he was very fond of discussions of eschatology and very fond of deriving, as a lot of people of low mentality are, from recent headlines, the possible fulfillment of scriptural prophecy, especially concerning the end of days. It used to worry me very much, because he did have potentially control over a nuclear arsenal. But it turns out, we didn't know this then, but we do know it now from his published correspondence, and he he had always thought that nuclear weaponry was absolutely evil. And he did seize the first chance he took, or, sorry, did seize the first chance that was afforded him to make a, an agreement with um, President Gorbachev as far as possible to defuse these mutual arsenals. So that it was exaggerated in Reagan's case, but I didn't, I, at the time, thought not by much. It was, one was right to be afraid of anyone yeah. within range of a nuclear weapon who talks in this manner. With President Ahmadinejad, I can preach it round, as they say, or preach it flat. As the, as, the, as the preacher says in Arkansas when he's asked to about, you know the show? No. The, the congregation is needing to hire a new preacher in Arkansas and they, they interview people who want, who want the job and they say, well, before, you, before we hire you, we want you to know that maybe half the people in this congregation do not believe the world is round. Though probably quite a lot of them do believe that it is, but many of them believe it's flat. So what, what's your opinion on this and he said I can preach it round I can preach it flat <laughs> religion is man made mm. well I can preach it round or flat I'm a I mean he this is a guy who does apparently believe that the the Shia Muslim version of the Messiah the Marti the Chauf Imam yeah. is not just coming back they all have to believe that but is 
should be expected imminently.